Hey guys, Ari here, back with the final part on this boundary wall. It's been all in this time. I've got a lot of footage. Bear in mind, it was only a two day job, this wall. Um, got about half a day left on it, so in total, a two and a half day wall. Managed to spin six videos of footage out of it, so. Um, I took this all the way up in this video, in this span of videos on this flank, so over the last four parts of this boundary wall, I've gone all the way from, I've laid, uh, 20 the walls 25 course I laid 19 on video so that's to give you an idea uh, well I laid 20 on video but uh, that was uh, one of the first courses was in part two so to give you an idea that's how long it stuck me obviously uh, each video has been about 15 minutes obviously there have been some cuts some edits but you know if every video is 20 minutes long it's took me from you know 20 times four parts of the video so 80 minutes you know it's took me two hours to run in you know 19 course of brick which obviously isn't isn't genuine because obviously the time building the corners and stuff that weren't on the video but just in pure running in time that's 80 minutes so that's like an hour and a half call it 80 90 minutes of, of footage there uh so you know it just gives you an idea of how quick you can run in using pick and dip and this is what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm not talking about pick and dip specifically because there's, en there's enough videos where I talk about that. But today I'm going to talk about uh, tables, the motorboard tables, and how useful they've become over the past, you know, good few weeks. I've been using them now. Um, they're really easy to move around. They're ideal to stack your bricks on. So that's one of the things you can do. Is especially I I tend to get bigger motorboards, so I tend to cut myself some big motorboards from uh, from the floorboard. Uh, section on the site I'm trying to get some floorboards and cut them a bit bigger uh, just so I can have like some space on the fr on the front of the motorboard to stack of you know six or twelve bricks uh, up and I tend to do that when I hit the milk crate height so when I get to milk crate height which is normally the last from where my feet are to about 19 course is you know comfortable reaching out for me 19 20 course I can comfortably reach and then after 20 19 to 20 course then I start get into milk crate height so i tend to get an extra five course off the milk crate i take most walls to 24 25 course i uh garages i tend to take them to uh 22 course um but obviously you're limited by how the ground's laid out because a lot of the time obviously these walls can be set a little bit further down into the ground so uh, with garages you're losing it you're not always right to your first brick you're always probably at two or three course lower than than you are on a wall so a lot of the time unlike a garage I'll get about 22 and that'll be a stretch whereas on a wall I can reach 25 so it's uh it's nice it's nice to be able to reach that extra that extra height with a milk crate and when I get the table set up, obviously, um, I have like a double manual ring set up that's the similar height to my tables. And then I have three tables. I never really work off more than four boards. Four boards maximum in this weather, to be quite honest. And even if that means my boards are a bit further apart, that's just how it's going to be. You know what I mean? Especially when I'm, if I'm running in like a flank on an house, I'll be, you know, I'll be, I'll be building a big corner each side running in uh, when I'm mentioning when I'm going on these footings uh, which you'll I'll have already been on for a few days now because this video is the third one I've recorded today so the first one I recorded today will come out on Monday the second will come out on Tuesday you'll be seeing this one on the Wednesday night uh, so by this time I'll have probably built most of the footing by then I'm reckoning I get the trench I reckon I get the trench blocks round in a day and a half then I get my splash round in about a day and then I'll probably get my so day called day day foot splash or day and a half at splash day foot day day and a half at trench for like three days. So I'll probably be on my internal walls now on the fourth day, and then I, I think it'll take me about a week to do a footing from what I can gather. Um, I think I think that that's reasonable. I don't know. Obviously, every next pair of hands might be faster, but I haven't even looked at how big it is. So if it's big probably be longer if it's smaller probably be shorter so but the, the tables are massively ideal as you can see they do lend themselves well to pick and dip obviously you can see that the speed i'm laying is like super super ideal at this height and, you, and when you get to this height traditional you tend to slow off a little bit obviously having to reach higher and higher spreading your long spread it is awkward 
So when you know when you are using the one at a time method or the front tip pick and dip or just the standard pick and dip, you know it is it lends itself well having them tables. Look, I'm not even bending to my motorboard and every brick. You can see every brick, look, every brick, I'm not bending. I'm not bending, there's no bending there. You know what I mean? I'm literally extending my arm. Obviously, I have quite long arms, so if you've got, you know, I wouldn't want to go higher than 700 because then you get, then you have the fact of if you're bending down past the board, you're going to have to bend up to the board to get your mortar. So one thing I tend to do when it comes to setting up my mortar stands is I tend to set them when I'm doing up to, when I'm, when I'm laying up to waist height or to thigh height, um basically just a bit you know mid 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 thigh just above the knee uh, i tend to just set my board you know my boards on a milk crate or on a couple of blocks or a manual ring you know i set them about 300 to about 200 to 300 off the floor when i'm on that height and then after you know it lends itself well to obviously being a one-on-one -on -one, because obviously you normally you'll use a tub up for the first six to seven course depending on how long your flank is with one tub so then we'll normally I'd have to get another tub, I'll go for snap, and then we'll set the tables up after snap, and then go for the go for the tables after that, set them up, or double up the manual rings. Uh, I'm gonna take a few extra over with me on this footing. I'm don't like I say I don't wanna use more than be working off more than four boards as it is, so obviously probably just gonna be working and building foot building a corner, running running into a dead man, then building another corner. And I'll probably run another dead man. So I'll probably go corner, run a course, dead man, corner, run a course, dead man, and have all my, all my trench up to max height in first day because ideally on my first day back on footings as a refresher, I'll just build all my corners, check them, make sure they're all to the right measurement, be, you know, super keen. I'll be super keen for the first day on having everything cock on. And then second day, I'll probably slack it off a bit and start sloshing them in pretty quick. Um... It's just one of them things, you know, You especially the first day on a new sort of work you haven't done for a while. Like, for me, footings, I haven't touched them in about four years. So, obviously, a little bit of a refresher needed on that. Well, proper proper, proper footings where you actually go into a measurement, not just like a boundary wall footing or a retaining wall. Like, retaining walls, they're just the basic same as building the boundary wall. It's just using blocks. But an actual footing where you've got a measurement, you've got to adhere to. You know, you would just take an extra bit of time check double check check the drawings make sure you're leaving out your you you know your duct your ducting your holes for your where your services are going in and stuff that's a common thing that we always forget so you're always smashing a block out ready for you getting your services in and then having to smash a couple out and put a lint over the top and just got to remember all this stuff so um especially when being so deep it's going to be more complicated as in the fact that you've got to wet, work out how many heights have got how many choice of trench to you where your service is going, then where do you need your lintels and, you know, your concrete lintels and stuff. And then I'll have to, as well, the first day, I'll be fucking quizzing, quizzing management over the prices, making sure that I'm getting the uh, best price possible. So all that's to think about on the first day. So it'll slow me off uh, pretty much quite a bit on the first day, but I'll probably record me some building some corners while the lads are loading out, uh, while old man's loading out with young lad, probably. And then... Hopefully we'll get some we'll get some run in, uh, but I'll ideally want to get my corners all set so everything works blocks everything works bang on so then we'll just we'll just blast it in on another day especially on the first day it's going to be hot tomorrow I think uh, we've got a bit of rain in the afternoon so that'll probably help cool us off a bit if I've done all corners in the morning when it's hot and when it rain comes we'll just start blasting them in and uh, should go around a bit easier with it being a bit wetter so uh, yeah but the tables are going to be a massive thing. Uh, I'll do some videos on how to load out in a footing uh, to, to limit back bending because obviously I was saying earlier, you know, look at the amount of times I bend, I bend over hardly at all. Whereas if you had your, if you had your board 250 off at floor with a one block, you know, I'm, I've got my I've got my board three times higher than that. So look at the lack of bending that I'm doing. Do you know what I mean? It's, you know, you, you'll lay more in a day just by being less tired. Do you know what I mean? So that's what I've got to emphasise with these mortar boards. You can even, you know, if you have access to scaffold boards on site, which we don't have a lot of on this job, uh, you can, you know, put your motor boards across your, your scaffold boards across your, across your tables. That's ideal, you know, to have your, have your bricks higher up. I probably am going to do that myself <laughs> at some point. But to be honest, I've got it. I've got a right system down where I stack my bricks, you know, double 12 at a time, 
you know, two brick comps next to each other all the way up till about I get to eight or nine I. And then once I've worked, once I'm up to my final waist height and above, I stack all my bricks in sixes right up, reload the boards and stuff. I get the old man to reload the boards while I stack. Because we take turns normally, like I'll stack the bricks up, you know, to pick and dip height uh, when I get to like above waist. Then he'll reload all the boards for us. So by the time I've done that, we can start running in again. And it's basically the same as having set up with, you know, with, with scaffold boards. But we, I'd do that, but it, it just, it's just another thing we ain't got on site and it's just another thing to slow you down. So that's, uh, that's, and you can't get enough bricks there a lot of the time. A lot of the time I like to load out. If I know I've got 300 bricks left to lay above the waist, I'll say, right, let's get all 300 there, and then we ain't gonna fucking reset again. So we'll get all 300 there, stack them right up in just sixes on top of each other, twisting every three three stacks of six, twisting them around, stop them falling. And then, you know, then we'll get up to like milk crate height, and then I'll stack all the, all the bricks right up. Uh, I'll stack them um, either right up on the, uh, either ride up on the boards, stack them on the boards is ideal, or uh, I'll stack them up on the floor, but I'll elevate them off like a block or something and have them ride up just two at a time and stuff like that. So yeah, um, uh, that's about it for talking about the boards this video. Uh, I don't really have uh, anything much more to say on the matter when it comes to this wall. Uh, all I'd like to say is I'm looking forward to going back to the London style trowel, which I talked about in the last video. Uh, I'm looking forward to going back to that trowel. I'm gonna uh, document my my pick and dip sort of review on what is the best trowel for pick and dip because obviously you see a lot of the big guy, a lot of the YouTubers like uh, what could I say, big pick and dip guys like Changi, you know, Stoke on Trent guys. Uh, they're using Tizaks. I uh, made a video actually going over the Tizak and how good it is. And now he uh, likes using it. So you've got them guys using Tizaks. You've got Charlie Connison using a Tizak, and then obviously the, the WHS fucking silly price vintage trowel. And then you've got who else are doing it? You've got some of the old, uh, some of the guys like uh, American guy J J W Bennett. He's using he does a lot of using London pattern, doing the uh, doing pick and dip at one at a time method. He, he does a lot of the time in his videos. It seems a lot of the guys in America as well, because a lot of the houses are built out of timber. They just have a big brick footing, so it's like a big brick footing that goes like 15 course from the ground. Uh, you know, gets them up to like, you know, chest height from the floor, and then they just start, they build the wooden house on top. That's where a lot of the, in America, you see a lot of the, the houses have like a wooden porch. Uh, they have a porch with a step up to the house where they blow the ground, blow the wooden sort of the cladding and the wooden, you know, a uh, timber framed house is it's all brick and block footing underneath so that's it seems you know that a lot of guys in america they have a good have a good thing going on building them because they're just like little little chest height square boxes so you when you get to basically when you start slowing down you stop because you've finished so that seems ideal obviously you know some of the stuff uh, they're using over there using little little uh, mini mini forks like a like a dingo trx thing to to uh to load the gear out was like fantastic obviously it's more obviously there's less big building sites out in america where it's not the same way as in the uk you know a lot of guys are doing sort of one job at a time but the job's that big because the houses are that big they've got that much space there's there's just there's so much there's plenty of work for everyone do you know what i mean there's plenty of work you're not sort of crammed onto one big site like you are over here in the uk um it's not, the, it's not the same way out, but obviously there will be similar sites over in, in the States. Um, but yeah, uh, there's what I've been watching also, watching Daz. Uh, Daz, who does the Brit, he's the Brickwork Fundamentals guy. Uh, I'm sure it's Daz. I'm sure it's Daz. I might be wrong, but I'm sure his name's Daz. I looked at one of his videos and the guy called him Daz. Uh, he's doing, he would do it. He's doing some big super cut-ups. Don't envy him at all. Fucking right, ball Lake. Uh, a lot of the new, a lot are doing these smart roofs now. They're doing smart roofs on this red row site as well, where you're banging the timber ties. A lot of the time, you're not getting paid for them. So, fucking watch out doing them. You want to get be getting like 50p a tie daily. So, that's uh, something to think about. Uh, you, you know, a lot of these guys are smart roofs, nice when you're not going to do your blocks and cut your blocks and 
put damps in, etc. But you're not getting paid for that extra time banging tyres in. You know, every time you bang a tyre in, you could have laid five bricks. Do you know what I mean? So there's uh, there's some trade-offs. That's one thing that put me off about timber frame. I've only done one timber frame job. I was uh, I was just out of my time and we were doing it building a skull timber frame using like a heritage brick but we had to we could on we uh, couldn't point it with traditional jointers we had to point it with his glove like a cement bag finish that was quite nice i remember you know lad who was lad who organized that job he were uh, he said he had some right money doing it on the timber frame but you know probably one on one you could earn good money timber frame i don't see why you couldn't actually thinking about it now but obviously banging ties in would slow you down but I've never had a never really had a problem doing that because that's what the old man I could set the old man doing to be honest. I just bang her. I'd probably set it to where if I had profiles up, I'd have the old man banging ties in on the course that you know requires ties. So I'd probably probably get him banging it in the course above where I was having the ties. So I'd have him put them all in while I was laying the course under him, and then I'd bend them down and put them in. I'd do it like that probably. Um, that's what I'd probably have him doing because he loves using hammer and nails obviously being a joiner uh, I'd like to get on a timber frame site to be honest the, the firm we're working for did mention countryside homes at one point who built a lot of timber frame and they didn't I don't think they end up getting that site but it would have been nice to get on a timber frame job just brick work a lot more a lot more uh, suited to like a one on one sort of style because everything's set out for you no, no, no timber, you know, uh, no door, you know, window profiles, no, the only thing you've got is damps, just nail up and tack on, uh, which is a lot of time they provide everything for you there, and the only thing you've got to put on is like small little lintels over openings and stuff, but obviously your internals are already, already in, so I remember him being, I remember him being a doddle to be honest, but I watched a video where Changi said he didn't like him because of a lack of excess, for his two and one guy, so we're only making day work money on him, but I think that comes down to your gang size as well. Like, obviously, me always working as one and one, you're gonna struggle earning money two and one if everything ain't perfect, and that's why I emphasize in a lot of my videos you know, if you can get away with working one and one, and you can get in a, in a situation where you've got consistently good work in front of you, one and one's fantastic, fantastic having a labourer. You've got to work different though. If you've never worked one on one, or if you've ever worked in gangs, it can freak you out. You, people feel a bit lost. But you know, once you get into your groove, everything's so efficient. You know what I mean? You'll even see uh, Collison talking about when he was one on one. A lot of his older videos when he were doing that thousand bricks while building corners and stuff. He just worked one on one then. And to be quite honest, I don't know why he done. I know he's trying to make some super money with with big gang, but you can't beat working one on one. It's a fantastic. Especially like, uh, in the in the next few years, when when my old man's when my old man drops down to two days a week, I'm gonna have like a, a labourer slash apprentice with me there full time, where I'll have him loading up for me, getting me all my gobbo, and then I'll have him jointing up and jumping online periodically. So obviously, you know, I'd be getting labourer's money, but I'm gonna try getting laying a few bricks as well, so uh, I can stop and show him and teach him and give him a bit of incentive, uh, but. I'm going to have to get another car because I'm only using one car at the moment. I always use a family car on the days I work on my own, so I'm probably going to have to get a dedicated work car. Uh, probably an estate. I'm going to probably try to get an estate. Ideally, I've, I had a Ford Focus before. I like the Fords. Probably going to get a Ford Focus estate again. Um, not looking forward to to getting my car insured again uh, under my own name because I've got uh, six points on my licence from getting a speeding ticket, so... Uh, not I'm not looking forward to paying that insurance bill on my car, but we'll see in the coming years if I had enough money in this year and if I start getting you know uh, getting some monetization from YouTube because I've I've reached I've reached five and a half thousand watch hours, which you only need four thousand to get partnered, and I just need a thousand subs, so I'm about six hundred and sixty subs at the time of recording this video. So if we can get to seven hundred, if we can get to a thousand by my birthday, that's my birthday's fourteenth of July, and I turn twenty six. If I can get to there before I turn twenty six, or if I get to somewhat close, if I get in the nine hundreds by the time I turn twenty six, 
I'm absolutely fucking over the moon because uh, I don't know what you get paid on YouTube per thousand views. I know it can vary depending on your monetized views and how, how long people watch the videos. But it'll be a fantastic addition to the channel. I'll be able to bring a lot better content because I'll probably be able to employ someone else to work with me full time uh, when my dad ain't working with me. Um, it's going to require me, but me needing more work in front of me because I'm going to have an extra set of hands. So I'm going to be getting through work a bit quicker. And I always said to to the firm I'm working for, I do plan on getting someone else with me. But it's just finding that right person who lives close enough to where I can pick them up and they're not with it, they're within five minutes or ten minutes of my house. Or they have their own transport, even better. Uh, because I've always got the old man to work with me. He ideally wants to do... He ideally wants to do th three, days, th three days a week slash two days, but for what I pay him for three days now, I'll probably end up being able to pay him that for two days. So his wage will go up a bit in the coming, hopefully in the coming uh, year, year, year or so. I try to give him a pay increase every year. Um, you know, whether that's, whether that's by fucking 50 quid a week. I know it's only a small amount per, per year, but you know, at the end of the day, he's got a lot faster and he's, he's still faster. Still, he's getting faster every day. I work with him to be quite honest and he's 64. So, you know, his money's going to go up in the coming, uh, in the coming in the next year and especially if we get on some bigger work if i get an apprentice with me or slash a laborer another laborer slash improver you know get him get him on a nice you know four or five hundred a week to start off um because I, 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 I believe in like paying laborers about 100 pound a 100 pound a day uh, if you're getting them on travel and you're having to break off yeah, maybe down to about 80 quid a day, so like that, depending on what how good they are, you know what I mean, and how, how their ability is, how hard they work. If they've got their own transport, you know, probably if they don't have their own transport, we're looking more at about 80 quid a day uh, to start off with, they're brand new. But if you've got your own transport, it's, you know, it's ideal. I've, I see a lot of guys wanting to pay 150, 150, 120, 130 for odd carriers, and if you're an experienced odd carrier, fair enough, you know, I, you know how the fucking game goes, you've got your own your own transport you get there early get in front etc yeah fucking bang on it's a solid good wage but for you know newcomers people have never done the job before you don't need to expect a lot out of them 800 pound a day is more than enough you know because that's like you know if you're doing eight hours a day that's 10 pound an hour at 80 quid an hour and that's if the, that's if you're teaching them but if they're like just getting in front just trying to load up for you 100 pound a day eight hours that's like 12 pound an hour 12 13 pound an hour in bad for a rank novice uh brand new to a job so uh yeah so i'll be looking for someone in next year or so uh I've, I've got a few apprentices in mind i'd probably be happy to you know work for four or five hundred a week to you know to learn learn a bit learn a bit and uh you know obviously on the trail and just just learning while learning you know it's uh it's an opportunity so anyway guys thanks a lot for watching in the next few months, you know, I'll probably look into it more, give it some more thought through, see how the old man's fixed, how he's feeling. But if we're still, you know, if we've still got plenty of work in front of us, I, you know, I wouldn't mind taking someone else on, but a lot of the time I'm struggling to keep getting enough work in front of me to keep earning. So that's why I, I, I just like to work with my old man at the moment. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you in tomorrow's video with a bit of uh, footage from being in the footings. So anyway, guys, that's watching. I'll see you next one.